And uh, today we are having communion, and so if you're at home especially, if you want to join us in communion, you're going to have to gather your own things. If we could send it electronically to you, we surely would, but that, we don't have that technology yet, but uh, communion is today. Good to see you all. Glad you're here. Are you enjoying the rain this morning? Yes, hopefully it will help wash away some of the smoke we've been experiencing and grow our lawns and our gardens and help all our farmers. So that's a good thing to have both sun and rain. So I'm grateful for all of those seasons. And as you know, of course, that this week we're going to be celebrating our independence from Britain. So take that, you Brits. (laughs) Just kidding. Um, So (laughs) I am grateful for uh, our freedom. And we have our freedom because of the vision and the love and the sacrifice of others who fought and died for our freedom. This morning, we're going to see another who has fought and died for our freedom because of his vision and his love and his sacrifice. And he overcame an enemy that seeks to enslave us as well, to use us and destroy us. And not just one group of people, but all the people of the world. This enemy is insidious and powerful and lives in all our hearts. This enemy, of course, is sin, which enslaves all humankind. Jesus indeed is the greatest of all emancipators. He is the hero of all humankind. He conquered sin and death by his sinless life and death-defeating resurrection. He broke us free from the power of sin and death. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. So this morning we're going to continue our series. This is part 21, which surely is going to be part 70 someday of the series through the Gospel of John. And so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn again to John chapter 8. And if you've been with us for a while, you'll understand the point of this book, which is to foster in us belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we will have life in his name. And as you read through this gospel, you should be struck time and time and time again as to the identity of Jesus, what others say about him, including John the Baptist, including the Holy Spirit, including God the Father where people experienced what he did and heard his authoritative teaching along with his claims about his identity. Jesus is doing this all the way along. Now, many people believed in him while others were, of course, still deciding where others resisted him. These were primarily the religious leaders who concluded that this man was calling himself God, which, of course, he did. They did not receive him and resisted him. And in this chapter, Jesus and these religious leaders are debating, are dialoguing during a festival time at the city of Jerusalem where there were thousands and thousands of people gathering to celebrate what God had done for them as a nation in the past. Jesus in that setting stood up and said that he was the bread of life. He stood up and said that he was the light of the world. And as people again resisted him, many believed in his name. And if you were with us last week, we concluded with verse 30. I'm going to bring it to our attention again, and it hinges us to what we're going to read about this morning. This is John chapter 8, starting with verse 30. It reads, as he, which is Christ, was saying these things, many believed in him. Him, believed that he was the Son of God, believed that he was Christ, and put their faith in him. 
Now, Jesus, because of this, shifts his focus on those who had believed in him. And he is who he claimed to be. They believe that he is who he claimed to be. They believe that he was the Christ, the Son of God. And he instructs them, those who believed, which includes many, if not most, of us in this room. So he's teaching to the crowd, he's debating with these Pharisees, and then many believed in him. And so then Jesus addressed those Jewish people at that time who believed in him. And this is important for us to hear, because what Jesus says here is heavy. It is significant. It has e eternal weight to it. Now the truth is, over the decades in which I've had the honor of pastoring congregations, not everyone who sat in the congregation 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, not every person who was there perhaps for years and perhaps for decades have continued to follow Jesus. That is a sobering reality for me as a pastor, and it's a sobering reality for those who have at one time said at least they believed and no longer follow Jesus. That strikes me that it was true then, and perhaps that they're in this congregation, there are those who are here and perhaps have been here for decades My hope is that your belief in Christ is true and genuine and from the heart. The only way for me and for us to know this is not this day, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And we all know of people, and perhaps you are and have been one of these people who believed, who drifted and returned, but some people walk from Christ. Jesus, of course, knew this as well. Jesus didn't soft coat the truth. He didn't soft coat who he was. We see that people turned from him as he proclaimed and claimed some things. Often in America, we love to package Jesus to fit the desires of our American culture, right? We love the gentle healer, right? And we can say amen to that. I love the gentle healer as well. But Jesus was and is a gentle healer, but he is also a prophet and a great king. He came both in grace, which we sing about that's amazing. We say amen. Amen. And coupled with grace, there was truth. Truth about who he is. And the truth about who we are. And indeed it is true that we have been enslaved. Not necessarily by a government here in this country. We have incredible freedoms which we are, and I hope you are, grateful for. But Jesus proclaimed in this passage, we've been enslaved not by a government, but by sin. Right? And he says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Right? So in this setting, Jesus then turned to those who believed in him. This is verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really or truly are my disciples. I want you to highlight that. I want you to underline that. And we're going to talk about this. I want you to consider it. 
This is the point, first one, I'm pointing us towards. True disciples, I got that right from the text, continue in the word of Jesus. Now, I would love it if all it took was convincing people to pray the prayer. Right? You know the prayer I'm talking about. Asking Jesus into your heart. Jesus into your heart. That is putting faith in Him. And we lead people to pray a prayer, and it's a good prayer, right? It is a good prayer. That prayer is the starting line, not the finish line. You say, well, you know, they prayed the prayer. At 5 or at 7 or at 12 or at 23 or at 46. Is that important? 100% it's important. But how do you know if one meant it? How how do you know? It's easy to say the words. Sometimes people will just pray the prayer to get that annoying person away from them. I am not kidding. And you laugh because you know it's true. <laughs> right? All right, I'll just pray the prayer. Please leave my living room. Goodbye, right? I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it here in America. I've seen it on the mission field. Right? Is that... Genuine faith. Is that genuine faith? And how do you know? So Jesus, now now, get how striking this is. You remember who he's addressing here? You guys understand this. Verse 31, Jesus turned to those who had believed in him. And said, if you continue in my word, then you are really my disciples. Which means that every person who calls themselves a Christian, not every person is actually a Christian. Well, Dave, that seems pretty judgmental. Who said this? Whose authority? Go back one slide, please. Who said that? Okay. Who cares what Dave Spooner says? But you need to pay attention to what Jesus says. Okay. I don't have that authority. He has all authority. Right? I'm just echoing what he said. Continuing in his word. Some Bibles that word continue will be remain in. Some will be stand in. Some will say hold to or abide in. The theological term is called perseverance of the saints. So those who cling to Jesus as the Word incarnate and hold to, remain in, follow to the best we can. This is not legalism. This is based on love. Those who do that are true disciples. That's sobering, and we can say amen to that. When I read this, um, I would like to think that all the people I love love Jesus. Wouldn't you like to think that? I, I would. They know about Jesus, 
<laughs> by the way, the Pharisees knew about Jesus. By the way, the devil knows about Jesus, by the way. More than likely, he knows a lot more about him than you do. He doesn't believe in him. Jesus, over and over again, pointed to this. Do you remember him and the Samaritans and those in other towns? Just came to him because he could do the stuff. Right? Remember, at this point, his brothers don't even believe in him. We have to ask the question, do you love Christ? And most of us in here would say, I hear you brothers and sisters. Are you abiding in the word? Is the word abiding in you? Are you living to follow Jesus? Or you think he's living to follow you? <laughs> Which he's not, by the way. I think often in America, we think Jesus exists to do our will. <laughs> and if he doesn't, we get angry at him. Same thing happened then, same thing happens now. Jesus is not asking you for directions because he is not the one who is lost. He's not looking for your vote because he's already the king. He says, come, follow me. So I have to ask you a question. And I prayed um, this morning. I prayed this week. I don't know what this congregation is going to look like a decade from now. I guarantee you it will be different. Some of you will move away. Some of you will move on to glory in a decade. Some of you will still be here. Others will be here. And some of you may slip away. Now, the important thing is in following the word of Jesus and being in Christ. Do you love Jesus? him and if you say yes then are you abiding in his word well dave i'm busy do you eat regularly y'all do that everyone in here does it You don't seem too busy to do that. Well, Dave, my favorite show is on. So is mine. Now hear me, I'm not trying to guilt you. Okay, just hear me. It's a legitimate question. Where are you at with Jesus? Well, I come and see him on Sundays. I'm here, Dave. Awesome. Right? Does his word abide in you? That's going to sustain you. Do you love the word made incarnate? Do you, will you, are you continuing in the words of Jesus. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. Now, Christ connected that phrase to a phrase that most of us know by heart. Verse 32, notice the little word and here, <laughs> it connects these two phrases. Verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Right? 
Second, two disciples are freed by the truth of Jesus. See the connection here, right? By continuing in the Word of God, then you will know the truth. And the truth then will set you free. This is not any and all truth will set you free. This is the truth from the Word of the Lord that will set you free. Now, our society have adopted this phrase, right? I've been in unbelievers' house, and they say they don't believe in the Lord, but they'll have a plaque that says, the truth will set you free, right? This phrase has been adopted by movies, right? In courtroom scenes, the truth will set you free, right? John Hopkins University adopted this phrase as their motto, and I don't think they claim to be Christian. Right? The truth will set you free. And do you know in the original CIA building, etched in stone, is the second part of this verse, right? Not the first part, but the truth will set you free is etched in stone in the original CIA building. The truth of that is, in their case, in that context, the truth might make you a captive, right? And put you in jail, Is truth powerful? Absolutely. Does all truth set you free? It does not. Right? So when Jesus said this, note the and. (laughs) If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. This is significant to see the context and the connection. The truth about Christ and the truth that is in Christ that will set us free. Now the question is, what are we being set free from? Is it our small thinking? Is it our physical conditions? Is it our financial debt? What is it that we're being set free from by the truth that is in Jesus? That's a question we must ask. And that was a question that was asked when Jesus first declared these words, right? We continue to read in verse 33. Those who were listening said this, we are descendants of Abraham. They were physical Jews. This was their ancestry. They're saying, we're descendants of Abraham. They answered him. And we have never been enslaved to anyone, right? Which wasn't true. Remember Egypt, but they're saying, hey, no one truly has enslaved us, so to speak. They say, well, how can you say you will become free? Verse 34, Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. The freedom that Jesus offers is not political freedom. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Amen. The truth that Jesus came to set us free is personal, it's pervasive. And it's powerful. It's sin. Trespassing the will and the law and the heart of God. Everyone who commits sin is captive, enslaved by sin. Now, I don't know everyone in this building personally, right? but I do know something about you. <laughs> you need the grace of Christ to free you from slavery of sin, including this guy. If you say, well, Dave, I'm not that bad, <laughs> you're probably not. Given the measure that we typically measure by, right? well, I haven't killed anybody pretty dang good. (laughs) I've been faithful to my spouse. I don't lie that often. (laughs) 
I'm in church, are I not? Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Meaning, sin captures our heart. It now is in control and it entices us, pulls us, and captures us. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go. And it's serious and it's insidious. So when Jesus said that the truth will set you free, the truth about him will set you free, and we know this truth when we abide in his word, what we need to be freed from ultimately, eternally, is not a political regime or debt or physical bars. It's sin. Now, Paul echoes this in Romans and other places, but he talks about it this way in Romans chapter 6, verse 20. Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote for us, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. You didn't live according to to God's directive. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? And I have things that I'm not proud of. You think back on your own life, hmm, what came from that? For the end of those things, guess what? Death. Verse 22, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become, this is interesting, slaves, servants of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification, that is becoming more and more like Christ, and its final and which culminates in eternal life. And this classic verse, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That kind of covers it, right? (laughs) Covers it covers it. We were captive and made slaves to obeying our sin nature. Christ paid the penalty of our sin. How? By living as a human. And he was human, but without sin. And then the one who was without sin took the place of the one who had sin so that the one with sin could be set free from the power and the penalty of sin and made righteous. That's the gospel. But we must believe in the one who sets us free Like a bird from the cage, he unlocked the door. And we can either walk in following him instead of choosing to give ourselves living for and in sin, but follow after Jesus and the freedom that he offers us. Now, do Christians sin? Some of you are telling the truth. Of course. Wouldn't it be awesome 
Like, wouldn't that be awesome? If we could just pray and never have a desire to sin again. Here's a confession. Your pastor has the desire to sin. Where does that come from? My old nature. Do I have to choose to give into it? Absolutely not. God gives us and gives us power to follow after him. So we are saints who are being sanctified, who occasionally sin versus those who are in sin, captured by it and running and obeying its desires. Ultimately, we're going to no longer have the sin nature. And we can say, amen. Amen. My wife shared with me a story of, uh, you guys know Johnny Erickson Tata? You guys know her? Wonderful lady. Strong, strong Christian lady. Who was paralyzed when she was in her high school days. From the next down, she's in her 60s now. 60s, 70s. <laughs> she's lived whatever, 60 years or 55 years, how long has been in a wheelchair. Paints, speaks, ministers to those, especially those who are wheelchair bound or struggling with some physical impairment. She was asked uh, at a conference by, you know, someone coming up to the microphone and they asked Joni, hey, um, what are you most looking forward to in heaven? Now, you would think the obvious answer would be being able to fully use your body as it was originally designed. You'd think that would be the answer. She didn't answer that way. She says, what I'm most looking forward to is being done with my sin nature. And if you have seen the destruction of sin, um, even in your own heart, You've seen it in the lives of people and even in your own life. It's evil. And it's cruel. But who the Son sets free is free indeed. This is what Christ offers to us. He offered it to those who were there. He offers it to us. Just come, taste and see. He says, come, drink the rivers of life. Come and you will not hunger anymore of your heart. So Jesus in this teaching continues. He says, I assure you, everyone commits sin as a slave to sin. Verse 34. And then goes on. And talks about this, verse 35, a slave does not remain in the household forever. But a son or a daughter, a child, does remain forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you really will be free. Third and last point, true disciples are adopted through the grace of Jesus. Now the difference between a slave and a son is a slave is temporarily connected to a family. And a son is permanently connected in the family. A child is in the family forever. So if the Son of God sets you free, you are free indeed. You are a child of God forever. You are adopted in as a child of God. And this freedom remains forever and ever. And we'll see Jesus talk about this next week as being a child of the devil, the liar in sin, or being a child of God and what that means. But this is powerful because belief in Christ is permanent when we are abiding in Him and remain in Him. We are an adopted 
to God's family, to the grace of Jesus. A few verses, Romans 8, 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery. Catch the language. You did not receive that from God, but the Holy Spirit, not the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. For in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3, you are all sons and daughters of God. How? Through faith. Ephesians 1, in love. He predestined us for adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This is the permanent state of the ones who believe in Christ and show themselves to be true children of God by continuing in the word of Jesus. We are a true disciple, a Christian, and an eternal child of God. We have been freed from the slavery to sin and have passed from death to life. And you cannot free yourself from sin. The Son must do it. If the sun sets you free, you are truly, truly free. So I was thinking uh, this week, I said, you know, it would be a good place to have a testimony. I said, who would give a testimony to this? A, uh, a name that immediately popped to mind is a guy named Rex Randall. Rex usually sits here. Here he is. Come on on, Rex. Uh, Rex has a story, and we all have stories. And so I've asked Rex, I said, hey, Rex, can you, will you tell us about what you were bound by and how Jesus freed you? And so why don't you go ahead and tell him your story. Hello. Hello. My so, name is uh, Rex Randall. I go by Resurrected Rex because... Uh, is that working? The mic? Hello? Okay. There you go. Keep it right up there. So, yep. <clears throat> I go by Resurrected Rex now because I was lost. Seven years old. I grew up in Hanover Park. Um, I had a stepdad that had long hair, so we couldn't cut our hair. I was bullied for having long hair because I looked like a girl. Um, so, second grade to seventh grade, I got picked on, beat up by 10 or more kids. I went home, I had uh, raised my two brothers and one sister, and uh, I didn't feel no love. Um, it was seventh grade is when I started fighting back. I started getting involved with gangs, and uh, I was just lost. 17, well, 16, my stepdad gave my mom an ultimatum, either him or me, so I left. And uh, the day I left, I had somebody come up to me and said, oh, can I pray for you? And I said that, that prayer. And I remember that moment. I had an overwhelming feeling. I couldn't ride my bike or anything like that. Looking back on it, I knew that was God. But at that time, I... I just shook it off. So 17, I moved to Rockford. Uh, I got involved with heroin. So I was on heroin for 10 years. I was living a dark life. Uh, I was far from believing. I didn't know God. Uh, I knew of him, but I didn't know him. So 2017, I put myself through the Rockford Rescue Mission. And it was about nine months into the program when uh, I messed up. 
I got in a fight with somebody, and that's when I reevaluated my life. Like, what am I doing? But I went to scripture, and it said, in Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I separated myself from all the people I was hanging around with, and that's where the true transformation began. And uh, that's when my language changed, my thought process changed, everything changed. So 2018, I got out, I got a job, I started uh, installing fireplaces. Since then, I have a house, a wife, a dog, and multiple vehicles. I, I started with a backpack. God is good. But <clears throat> through my darkest time, he was with me. I had to fully surrender to him in order for me to be free. I don't claim to be sober. I claim to be free because whoever is free is free indeed. So I just thank God every day for, for that person uh, that he made. And, um, it is truly powerful. And, um, he also told me, cause it, I worked with heights. I was afraid of heights before I started, but God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I thank him every day and, uh, to God be the glory. Thank you, bud. Proud of you. Well done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you see Rex uh, rocking around, you'll see him with a backpack. And he has much more than a backpack now. But inside of his backpack, if you ask him, more than likely, he'll have a cross or, tree, or three or a dozen in there. And uh, he makes these, you know, out of his own pocket, he, um, and then he gives them away. You know, he just prays and, and uh, let the Lord lead him and gives them all over the place. I have a few myself, but uh, he's living for the Lord. So thanks for that testimony. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. And there are stories in this congregation of us continuing to be like Christ. So be encouraged this day to continue to follow and hold to the Word of God. Okay? And I don't know what you're taking away this morning. Okay? I don't know what you're taking away. But take away something. Okay? Are we loving Christ? Are we holding to His Word? Are you, have you wrestled with who Jesus is? is there is no one who speaks like him. There's no one who can do what he has done. No one who's claimed the things that he claimed. No one who has been resurrected like him. Who do you say that I am? And if you believe, then give yourself wholeheartedly. Either continue in what you're doing, return back to him, or commit your life to following him. And as we celebrate, and we will celebrate this week, uh, the freedom of a nation in which we are to be grateful for, and I am grateful for. I want us also to think about the one who set us free from not a government, but from sin. One is temporal, and I'm grateful that we're here, but one is eternal. So as we see the fireworks, if you're going to do that thing, right? it's cool, it's great, love it. Also be thankful to God for his eternal freedom he gives to us from sin. And so we are going to receive and celebrate communion together. And so if the ushers would make their way down, and Tim, if you come on up. This is a way in which we can renew our, our faith in Christ. So, Tim, hey, thanks for leading us. I'm here at Cross Point. Everyone who confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior is welcome to join in communion, and we're going to take it all together. Um, 
And like if you missed, yeah, Byron and some of the ushers are coming down. And in light of what Dave taught us today in Rex's testimony, we can celebrate communion together because Jesus has set us free and adopted us as sons and daughters. And when I was preparing this, the word celebrate, I thought, that's a weird, is that an appropriate word? And um, because Jesus died and we're going to celebrate a death, that's that's very, it kind of took me off guard. But it is a celebration because Jesus did what we couldn't do and that he died for us. So in 1 Corinthians, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you so much, Lord. We celebrate what you did for us, that you came to this earth and you died for us, for our sins. You did what we couldn't do, and you you call us sons and daughters, which is just amazing. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. And we ask that you would help us to walk in obedience to what we need to do, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.